I am Warren Sprouse. This is the Bible Forum. We're here together every Sunday night from 8 until 10 p.m. Eastern, and we talk about life from a biblical perspective. I want to tell you the story of Perry Noble, founder, senior pastor of New Spring Church in Anderson, South Carolina. Pastor Noble has been fired after 16 years of ministry there. During that 16 years, the church has multiplied, it has grown, it has multiple campuses throughout the state. It averages 30,000 people every weekend. This South Carolina church reportedly held a closed door meeting with their elders earlier last week. Elders of the Baptist megachurch cited alcohol abuse and the pastor's, quote, posture toward his marriage, end of quote as concerning. Now these are very polite phrases for not so nice things. Executive Pastor Shane Duffy delivered the church leader's official statement to the New Spring congregation Sunday morning saying, quote, through much prayer and with a heavy heart we have important information to share with you regarding our pastor Perry Noble. As of Friday, July 1st, and in accordance with the governing bylaws, the directors and the pastoral advisory team have removed Perry as pastor of New Spring Church. While this is the most difficult and painful decision we have had to make, unfortunately it was necessary. Perry has made some unfortunate choices and decisions that have caused us much concern. They went on to report that over the course of several months, our executive pastors met with and discussed at length with Perry these concerns regarding his personal behavior and spiritual walk. Pastors Perry's posture toward his marriage, increased reliance on alcohol and other behaviors were of continual concern. Due to this, the executive pastors confronted Perry went through the steps of dealing with sin in the church as is outlined in Matthew chapter 18 and they have decided that he needs to step down. We are familiar with Matthew 18 as the steps of church discipline. They are not used very much anymore. But here they are. Jesus said, when you have a disagreement, a problem with a brother, a sister in the Lord, what do you do? You do not talk about them behind their back. You don't go and complain to the leadership or to anybody else. You go to the brother or the sister and you let them know you understand what they're doing. You point out to them their sin. The goal here is understanding. It's awareness. But it's reconciliation. You have done thus and so to me. And it's a sin. Now in some cases, people get their little panties in a bunch because so-and-so just looked at them funny and they didn't know what that meant. But Jesus said when your brother or your sister sins against them, against you, you go. You don't tell other people, you go. Reconciliation is the goal here. But understanding and awareness are part of it. If the brother, the sister, and the Lord admits their guilt, recognizes the problem, is willing to deal with it, seek forgiveness, it's over. And a person who did not intend to sin against you, did not intend to assault, insult or uh, offend you in any way, is quick to say, my goodness, I, I had no idea. I didn't mean that. I'm sorry you took it that way. And accept responsibility for not doing the right thing, not being clear, not paying attention, and creating this dynamic. 
to repent of that sin and, and to seek forgiveness. That's a great thing in a relationship. But what if they don't? Well, Jesus said if they don't, then you take someone with you. And the purpose here is to impress upon this offender who is refusing to listen to your loving counsel, uh, to impress upon them that this is important. And now here someone else is involved and they're hearing it with their own ears. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying to you in the presence of another person what I said to you privately. You're still seeking to reconcile that brother, that sister. You're not trying to condemn them. You're not trying to hurt them in any way. You just want this resolved. If they don't care to, then Jesus said you tell it to the church. Now you're doing this in front of everybody who is a member of that church, the family. And you're saying the same thing you said the first time. And you're pointing out that in saying it the first time, this person just thumbed their nose and walked away. They didn't care. And in taking someone with you, they did the same thing. Now the someone with you would be the, the evidence that maybe you're just being sensitive or maybe this isn't really an issue just as much as it would be that the other person is a dirty rotten scoundrel but you're now making it public and only because the person refused to deal with it privately and the congregation now says having heard both sides the congregation now says to this person y you were wrong and and you really need to make this right and Jesus said, if the person will not listen to you, if they will not respond properly to you and to the others in the body of Christ, then their sin should be made public in this limited group called the family, and they should listen to what this family now is going to say to them. Each step of the way, the goal is always the same, understanding. I didn't know what you were doing. It looked like this. It sounded like sin. Maybe it wasn't. Help me here. And it meant reconciliation. I am deeply repentive. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I didn't realize it was coming off that way. I do see that that's sin, and I don't want that between us. Can you forgive me for that? I accept responsibility. Or there's an explanation and you, oh, well, I didn't understand that. And there's healing, but it's resolved. There's nothing in the, in the church. There are no festering relationships in the church. It's the failure on the part of the offending brother or sister that moves this thing to the next step, whatever the next step may be. And in the end, should they refuse to repent, to accept their right, responsibility, and so forth, then they are to be removed from the membership, from the fellowship of that body of Christ. Because a true Christian would not do that. A true Christian would, would want their heart to be right. And so you're putting that person out of the membership of the church saying, there's something here we don't understand and we don't know your heart, but what you're saying to us tells us that this is inconsistent with what a Christian heart should be doing. It highlights the importance here of a godly lifestyle. It also highlights the importance of protecting the corporate testimony of Christ. We don't want people in the church that are running roughshod over other people, and they don't care. The goal here also is to keep from encouraging other people that this is an okay behavior. That's why you do it on a public level. Other people see this, hear this, and oh, mm, mm, I better be careful. And that's a good thing. It's also to provide a godly testimony in the eyes of the world, as this particular church did. But sadly, this process has either been neglected or it has been horribly abused 
in the last 20 or 30 years. And in the eyes of the world, it appears to be punitive, and it's not. You see, the world doesn't understand. The world does not like it when churches follow through with discipline. They don't see the value or the purpose of this. They're not saved. They don't have the same moral code, the moral value system. They look at it and say, well, come on, people are people. Things happen. If a church holds someone to a higher standard, then they must be condemning that person. No. But you can't build a mega church being picky about abortion or premarital sex or drug abuse or violence in the home. It's just not possible. Now here, because Pastor Perry chose not to properly address these issues, meaning he refused to repent and to quit doing them, and that's what the elders, the deacons, or the, the leadership team, whatever it is, is saying, we met with him over a period of months, nothing changed. He did not take the necessary steps toward correction. They're saying they believe he's no longer qualified, as outlined in 1 Timothy chapter 3, that's what they said, and according to the church bylaws, to continue as pastor of that church. Let me read to you the passage then in question, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Paul says, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then, however, must be blameless, blameless in the eyes of the community. Nobody in his world pointing a finger saying, you made it, you did this and you didn't make it right. He must be the husband of one wife, not one at a time, but only one. He must be vigilant, sober, meaning alert to what's going on, of good behavior, given to hospitality. Makes you wonder about these guys that live in gated communities. Apt to teach. He may not be a good teacher, but he is apt to teach, and he can teach, and he will teach. Not given to wine. Not a striker. Doesn't get in brawls with people. Not greedy of filthy lucre. And that is a broad statement. These pastors who are taking money they don't deserve being paid huge salaries while people in their congregation are living on Social Security. All that's filthy lucre. But rather patient, not a brawler, not covetous, not, but one that ruleth, his, ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Because if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And he's not to be a novice, lest he would be lifted up with pride and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that which are without. The world shouldn't be able to look at him and say, he's an idiot, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy or filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. The church's attitude is expressed in their concluding statement. They said, we will continue to love Perry and his family during this difficult time. And we are committed to continue to pray for his healing. And we are also committed to continuing to provide personal support to Perry and his family in the days ahead. Sounds like they're willing to pay him for a period of time. Though we know you may want more details to satisfy your curiosity, to do so would not be helpful to Perry or his family as they take these next steps. Our faith remains strong, they said, rooted in the power and the promises of Jesus Christ, 
and the gospel gives us hope that Perry and his family can experience healing. The same gospel also gives us confidence that New Spring Church will continue to make a difference in our state. In the coming weeks, we ask that you join us as a church family in continual prayer for Perry, his family, and our church. We do believe the best is yet to come. Duffy also delivered a statement that Pastor uh, Noble prepared for the church. And in this, he said, Hello, New Spring. I hope you had an amazing week, and I know the service today is going to be awesome. However, I come to you with a heavy heart to let you know that effective July 1st, I will no longer be the senior pastor of New Spring Church. I wish this were a joke or part of a sermon illustration. However, it's true. I've often told you that New Spring exists to help hurting and perfect people. I have joked that you should not attend New Spring if you are already perfect because I will mess you up. That was my way of telling you that I'm traveling on a journey each day alongside each and every one of you to try to take my next step to become more like Jesus. If you've attended New Spring for any length of time, you know I've never claimed to be the perfect pastor or even the perfect Christian. What we've seen the Lord do over the last 16 years has been a modern-day miracle. However, in my obsession to do everything possible to reach 100,000 and beyond, it has become it has come to a personal cost, at a personal cost in my own life and created a strain on my marriage. In my opinion, the Bible does not prohibit the use of alcohol, but it does prohibit drunkenness and intoxication. I've never had a problem drinking alcohol socially, but in the past year or so I've let myself slide into, in my opinion, the overuse of alcohol. This was a spiritual and moral mistake on my part as I began to depend on alcohol for my refuge instead of Jesus and others. I have no excuse. That was wrong and sinful, and I'm truly sorry. For those disappointed in me, let me assure you that no one is more disappointed in me than myself. I realize that I cannot continue to do effective ministry if this issue in my personal life is not adequately addressed. He goes on to explain what's next and how he will strive to be a better person what he does not do is accept personal responsibility for his actions. What he does not do is repent of those actions in godly humility. He justifies his actions to the very end and then concludes with uplifting and inspiring words for both the congregation and his family. This is not what a godly Christian does. They don't do this. This is not what a God called pastor does. This is what the world does. Pastor Perry said, as for me, I'm uncertain as to what my next step is. The one thing I know, I'm going to put 100% of my time and effort into becoming the best father and husband I can. I would ask that you pray for my family and me as we seek out what's next in our lives. I preach that the best is yet to come for 16 years. I can't say it for you, but I must receive it as well. I don't know what's around the corner, but I know Jesus isn't finished with me yet, and he's not finished with New Spring Church. I love you and always will. I'm really sorry and ask you to forgive me. Let me be clear, he says. Neither Lucretia nor I have committed any sort of sexual sin. I have not stolen money. I have not been looking at porn, and there is absolutely no domestic abuse. This is the story, period. I simply need to address an issue that has gotten out of hand in my life. I plan to immediately seek the spiritual guidance of some amazing men and women of God in my life, and I am currently under the treatment of an excellent psychologist, who is helping me take some major steps forward. A sad end to a hopeful start. Sixteen years they sat under the ministry of a man who does not understand grace, does not understand purity and honesty and spirituality, does not know what it is to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He would have benefited from my book, 
breaking out, it would have helped him immensely in knowing what the next steps should have been. And applying them, he would have grown and been strong and led that church for years. But instead, he has chosen a more human approach. No one knows his heart. We have no clue as to why he is in the ministry or why he started that church or what's going on. But where he is now tells us that whatever it was before, it wasn't godly. It wasn't the way the Bible describes it. But Pastor Perry is a token, a pattern, a template. He's probably 10 times better than most of these guys you see on television today because they all have this same mentality. We pray for the Pastor Parries in this world. There's hope for them. For some of these other guys, there's no hope at all save the dramatic in interruption, interference, intercession of the Spirit of God in their life. I turn on the television, the, the internet, and I look at these people and the vast majority of them do not look like saved people. Not if you're using a Bible as, as your measure. This church will survive this because the elders, deacons, leaders, whoever they may be, did it right. So many churches do it wrong. They cover for their pastor. Their pastor's hiding out in a gated community. He's jetting to New York or California every week to do meetings. He's never home. They don't know who he is. They parade his family and they're all gussied up and they look pretty, but we don't know what they're like. They don't live like the people in their congregation. They just take their money and their acclaim. And then they say, look what I have done. And we're learning that many of them have done far worse than Pastor Perry. We pray for that church. Don't know what it is. I think it's a Baptist church, maybe a Southern Baptist church. I don't know. Nobody puts the word church on their building anymore. They don't want to identify with denominations because the average uh, millennial coming up doesn't really want to be attached to any denomination. You say it's a Methodist, it's a Presbyterian, it's a Baptist. They eh, don't want any part. We know who you people are. They want it free and easy and, and just more flexible. Okay. That's what they got in Pastor Perry. What's your church like? You ever seen church discipline in your church? It isn't that you have to see it, but if your constitution does not specify it as a remedy, it's not a biblical document. People are people. Things happen. There's only one way to resolve them. And Jesus told us what it was. You can pick another one if you want, but this is the one that God says is right. Check it out.